Hello, Rebel Connections, and welcome to this current literature review. I'm Ali Nasser, and I'm happy to be joined today by Dr. Donald Nixdorf, who is the author of a significant recent study that was published in this month's JOE, uh, Journal of Endodontics, the April edition. And the title of the article is Differential Diagnosis for Persistent Pain After Routinal Treatment, a study in a national dental practice-based uh, research network. Uh, and uh, Dr. Nixdorf needs no introduction, but uh, he is the Associate Professor and Director of the Graduate Program at the University of Minnesota and the Division of TMD and Orofacial Pain. He's also the Adjunct Assistant Professor in the Department of Neurology, and he's done many great contributions to the field in terms of uh, odontogenic pain and non-odontogenic pain. His specialty is neuropathic orofacial pains and trigeminal neuralgia and the deafferentation pain, such as the atypical odontology and so on. Um, Dr. Nextdorf, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. So this article, uh, you know, differential diagnosis for persistent pain after root canal therapy or treatment, I mean, that itself grabs the attention because all of us as clinicians out there who do root canal therapy have had to face a situation where uh, you've done the best you can do, the root canal looks beautiful on the x-ray, but there are still some persistent symptoms. Luckily, these things don't occur that often, but when they do occur, it's important to have a good sense of differential diagnosis at a clinical level of what could be the causes. And your research was pioneered in this area quite uh, a bit. And I just wanted to kind of give you a chance to first just give us the synopsis of the article that, uh, that you wrote, and then we'll ask you a few questions and, uh, and so on. So oh, can you give us the overall synopsis and the, the, the impetus behind the article? Sure. So it, it all, this started back uh, with a meta-analysis that myself and colleagues, um, namely Alan Law and Stefan Moana, uh, did. And what we looked at was is looking at how much pain exists as a, from a frequency perspective uh, after root canal therapy. And looking at the studies that uh, presented both data on what was odontogenic and what was non-odontogenic, we found that roughly half of the patients, or 56% of the patients there, uh, had a non-odontogenic reason. So that kind of made me scratch my head a little bit and go, wow, that seems a little bit high. And I was thinking, okay, well, what are the potential things that could be? So from my background in TMD and artificial pain, typical differential diagnosis is going to fit into one of four categories. It's going to be referred muscle-based pain or maybe sinus-based pain. Muscle TMDs are going to be the most common probably. You're going to have your neuropathic pains. Uh, for the most part, those are the continuous pains. The one exception is trigeminal neuralgia, which is going to be episodic. You're going to have your headache disorders presenting as a tooth pain. Most of them are going to be kind of come and go with uh, a few that are con uh, continuous in nature. And then you're going to have other pathologies that are going to be more regional or distant that are going to refer and mimic tooth pain or, or kind of uh, be the charlatan in, in tooth disguise, if you will. So those are the four that you kind of want to be thinking of. So what we were doing is, is we we're doing an observational study within the network. Um, and so uh, looking at that, we had an over-enrollment in Minnesota. So uh, the, we had 390 patients within Minnesota that we looked at. And we were able to follow up 354 um, at six months. And of those ones that we followed up, we looked at how many reported some average pain, so one on a zero to 10 scale or greater, um, as well as some days of pain in that last month. And what we found was, is within our regional sample, 11% of patients, or 38 out of the 356, uh, sorry, 54, um, had pain. And what we did is, is we asked them, uh, the ones that at least gave consent to be followed up uh, above the initial study, can you come back in? Uh, I want to have a dentist, myself, and, uh, and an endodontist uh, look at the patients and kind of see if we can get some sort of understanding of what's going on with them. And we uh, clinically evaluated 19 of these patients. Of interest, so the average time from the when patients reported pain in the study and then brought back into our uh, clinic was about, I think average was about 40 days. I can't remember off the top, it's in the article. Um, and what we found was is that two of those 19 were completely symptomatic free. So they had no tooth pain, no functional pain. We could not derive either an endodontic diagnosis or a non-endonogenic diagnosis. 
uh, two patients had no diagnosis that we could come up with, donogenic or non-donogenic. And we had seven that had a donogenic reason for the pain. And in this case, it was determined that four of them was the tooth that was originally treated, and three of them was the adjacent tooth. Um, and also, there were um, uh, two other patients where they had an both an odontogenic and a non-odontogenic reason for their tooth pain. And in those instances, one of them had a persistent neuropathic pain. It was fairly clear that that um, pain actually pre-existed any root canal treatment. And for this individual patient, uh, she'd actually had a mid-phase trauma and had uh, signs and symptoms that were consistent with uh, pre-existing neuropathic pain. Which, um, and then there was another uh, patient where I had both tooth pain diagnosis as well as comorbid TMD diagnosis. And what I mean by TMD is uh, using the new diagnostic criteria that was published in the beginning of 2014. And what this criteria is uh, and why it's of interest, I think, to endodontists is, is you palpate the muscles of mastication and you ask a couple of questions. You ask the patient uh, when you're provocating, um, does the pain made worse with function, pair function, or provocation. In this case, it can be palpation. So say you're pressing on the master muscle and you would ask, does it hurt? And the patient may say yes or no. If they say yes, then you can ask them, does the pain reproduce why you're here today? So uh, sometimes what patients will say is they'll say, yes, it's my pain. It stays into this area of pushing, but it doesn't go anywhere else. Um, so that would be positive if they have jaw pain too, but it wouldn't be, say, part of their tooth pain. But in all these instances that we published in this article, they said, yes, it hurts in that muscle, say like the example I'm using here, the masseter muscle, and it refers to my tooth pain, and it's part of the tooth pain or why I came in to see you. So it's that referred pain phenomenon, and that new diagnostic criteria has that linkage. So the questions uh, as a clinician should be looking at is, is, uh, does it, is it made worse with provocation? Does it reproduce the tooth pain or why you're there? And that kind of helps separate, is there an non-odontogenic reason from an odontogenic? And why I think it's really important is that there was a high amount of muscle-based pain in this um, cohort of patients that were reporting persistent tooth pain. Uh, the next story, we've been, you know, for years, I remember back, at least in the 60s and 70s, um, Dr. Shelder, for example, coined the, the, this, this, this sentence that endodontics is successful 100% minus X, X being the operator factor. And now it seems like your research, and there's been also just intuitive um, uh, understanding over years of practice, we realize that, you know, uh, there is also other components, as you're saying, that are non-odontogenic reasons for persistent uh, symptoms postoperatively, such as TMD and such as um, uh, neuropathic issues and so, uh, so on and so forth. Are there um, things that, you know, dentists can do clinically during the procedures to help reduce the incidence of non-odontogenic uh, uh, post-op discomfort. I mean, for TMD, I would assume, you know, making the procedure short using night uh, bite blocks and so on would help. Anything else you can think of? So uh, that's a really good question. Um, we don't have great research in this area, so I can't give you a real strong uh, data-based answer. I can give you my clinical impression. So since the vast majority of the pain that was not adrenogenic that we've seen, uh, and my clinical judgment would suggest is TMD-based, I think the thing that you should focus on mostly is the prevention and management of TMD. So a couple of things I think are helpful to be looking at it there. Uh, a TMD clinician is going to look at some of the, the basic things, just like you would uh, treat, say, lower back pain. They're going to look at self-care. They're going to be talking about jaw awareness. 